Okay, so again, everybody, thank you for joining me. Welcome to using rubrics for assessment. I thought we'd maybe just get started with a couple of icebreakers today. Um, but first, just to let you know about our agenda, um, after the icebreakers, we're gonna kind of jump straight into the different components of the rubrics. We're gonna take a look at how we can customize these uh, for everybody's needs because we end up having different fields that we're in, different types of projects. And so there's a lot of different ways that you can design a rubric just to meet your individual teaching needs. Uh, we're gonna look at the different types of rubrics that are available. And then we have some specific tips available for you for rubric creation. Um, so today I will uh, record this session and following the workshop, I will send you a link to the recording as well as all of the links that you're going to see for resources in the workshop. So if you're scrambling to write those down, uh, don't panic, I will send those to you. So you'll either get that today or tomorrow. Um, and then of course we're going to have a wrap up. So, uh, but right now I'd like to know a little bit more about each of you. So here's our activity, whatever form of communication you're most comfortable with. It seems like some of you already found the chat. So um, you can type in there or you can turn on your microphone, but I'd just like to know your name and what field you're teaching in. And then one of the two questions here that you'd like to answer. What's your comfort level with using rubrics? Are you using them frequently, rarely? Um, you use them, but they could be better. Um, there's all different levels. There's no right or wrong answer here. Or think about how do you feel grading with a rubric as a teacher versus how you felt as a learner who was being graded with a rubric? So I'm gonna pause and I'll see where we're at. Okay, thank you. It looks like I see some typing going on here in the chat. International management and global operations. Ooh. And Russ, you use rubrics when grading papers and presentations. Great. So we are going to take a look at that. Um, nonprofit and NGO studies. Uh, You almost never had them as a student and you don't like creating them as a teacher, but you do love having them as you're grading. Ah. So I do have some uh, hopefully tips and resources for you towards the end of the workshop that'll make that a little less painful for you. So that sounds great. Great. An assistant professor of athletic training. You've created a few uh, rubrics, but you think they could be better? Great. And I think I missed some up in here. Sorry, I'm bouncing around. Um, it looks like there's a few of you from early education. Well, the good news is it sounds like everybody's at least familiar with rubrics. Um, maybe you've used them in some capacity or had them um, available to you as a student, maybe, although it's not always the consensus. All right, well, today's workshop is really focused on taking this familiar concept of a grading rubric and customizing it to meet your needs, um, which in a lot of times can expedite the grading process. So I think we can go ahead and move on. Like I said, if you have any questions, comments, feel free to keep using the chat. People seem familiar with it. So um, just keep doing that and we'll go on. So before you can actually start creating your rubric, you have to establish some of this basic criteria. And there's a few questions that I would encourage you to think about um, before you start actually designing this. So some of these questions involve 
what are the attributes of the quality of the performance or the task that you're looking at? So in other words, uh, which qualities or features um, would demonstrate whether students have produced an exemplary response to the task? Uh, but then you might also wanna ask yourself what tasks um, have they performed proficiently? What is your definition of an adequate performance? Um, and then what is maybe deficient? So once you have some of these definitions going in your mind, um, then you want to also ask yourself, do you have models of student work that exemplify this criteria um, that you will use to assess your students? Because they actually do want to see examples of both um, kind of ends of the spectrum. If we tell our students we want you to excel in this you know, area, then show them what an excellent piece of, you know, work looks like versus show them what is just a good solid performance look like and maybe what does a poor performance look like. Uh, we found with students that they like to see kind of equal numbers of all of those types of performances. You can't just show them all of the negative things and you can't say just don't do this. Um, you also do want to show them examples of what you're expecting. So just in a basic definition, well, what is a rubric? It's all four of these things that you see up on the screen. It's an assessment tool. It is a systematic scoring guide, um, but it is also an instructional guide showing students how they're going to be assessed. And it is an explicit set of criteria used for assessing a specific type of work or performance. So um, I know some of you said that you're using rubrics for written work. Some of you are using it maybe for speeches. So we're gonna take a look at some of those today too. If I can advance the slides in order, maybe. <laughs> um, what can your rubrics accomplish? Well, as you can see up here, um, I have a lovely little anchor. So rubrics can actually help us set to anchor points along a quality continuum so that we can set reasonable and appropriate expectations for students and to consistently judge how well they have met them. So that is actually a definition that we swipe from the University of Minnesota, but I, I did appreciate that. So. Rubrics also um, divide the assignment into pieces. Instead of making it look like this one big overwhelming task, a rubric will help break it into chunks for the student. So it's a very strong idea to hand out your grading rubric to your student um, at the time that you assign the assessment. Now, there are some key differences here between our checklist and a rubric. So I, I know some of this uh, can overlap and I just wanted to point out a few of these differences. So with checklists, they're mostly yes or no criteria, they're absolutes. Um, it's great for when you're introducing a basic skill or a process, but there's really not um, an emphasis on the judgment or the quality of their work. And I think that's a, a key attribute that we want to look at. Um, it doesn't indicate the student understanding. Um, it doesn't tell us if they've mastered a particular skill. And it also doesn't give you any room to provide uh, detailed performance feedback. So that's kind of on the checklist end of the spectrum versus rubrics have a little bit more nuance. Um, they are not black and white. When we are assessing our students' work, um, there's this quality of, well, it's a quality that we're looking for. We're looking at their performance and it's designed to be subjective. So your rubrics are going to reflect that as well. So you use it when you want to assess your students' learning. You're going to evaluate them on a certain set of criteria you're going to indicate whether students have mastered the content and you're also going to provide feedback and your feedback usually reflects things like what they can do in the future um, as they continue to revise and improve. All right, so now as we move into the components of a rubric, I was thinking of it kind of like a pie. So I, I tried to give you a little bit of a pie there. It doesn't look wonderful, but... Um, much like an assignment that we give to our students, the rubric is 
comprised of multiple moving parts. Um, but once you put them all together, it does form a whole kind of unanimous piece. So rubrics can be used to um, assess. So this can be for uh, certain features of an oral presentation maybe. You could also be looking at a written report. So does it have a beginning, middle, and end? You could use rubrics for musical performances. Uh, we can even use them for math and problem solving. There's now kind of a heavy emphasis on making sure that we know how our students arrived at the answer, not just that they came up with the right answer on a multiple choice exam. And we also can use it for things like case studies. So when you look at this little pie that you have on your screen, we've kind of got all these different sections. There is the task description. This area kind of involves the performance, the product, the outcome. Think of it like the big umbrella piece. Next to it is the criterion. And that one is all about the traits, features, dimensions. Um, it's kind of like a slice of this pie. It, it's the standard of excellence, if you will. The levels of performance, you wanna include at least two of these, probably more in your rubric. Um, two would be pass and not pass. Um, so we usually have more than two, uh, but that's the bare minimum. And then the descriptors, well, they are the, they describe the levels, they're the gradations. Your scores could be either point values or percentages, either will work, um, but they add value to rate each criterion. And then you have your weighting factor. So that you're going to give more value for one criterion um, than another, or that's often the case. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit here. So I have um, actually some kind of little, little pictures um, where I zoomed in on some actual rubrics. And I wanted to show you some things that you can do, how you can customize this for you. So we're gonna take a look at this in a couple of different slides here. But this one is actually an excerpt from a rubric that's used to grade an essay assignment. Uh, my background it personally is in teaching English composition. So um, you're gonna see probably in most of my examples, uh, this is just where my mindset goes. But again, we could customize this. So this particular essay rubric um, had six criteria. Um, and I know you can see two of them up there, but I had purpose, research, content development, organization, formatting, and mechanics. So um, you can see them kind of outlined in green on the left side of the screen there. The criteria uh, basically are just letting our students know how they're going to be assessed. So I decided that there were six main components. Um, so this is what I, I broke it down into. All right. Now in this one, you'll notice that I kind of highlighted the top of the screen there. So this is the level of performance um, that appears at the top of the rubric. And these are the degrees to which students have mastered the criteria. You can customize uh, what you call these levels of performance, um, but you may also want to include definitions of what you mean by the terms in either the grid or in a blurb somewhere in the course. You could put it in your uh, syllabus. So there's a bunch of places where you could clarify what this means, um, but you can play around a little bit with the language. So um, I do encourage you to to play with this, to toy with it. You'll be surprised what kind of an effect it has on your students. Um, I've heard of, you know, there was some sort of a, a competition in a classroom and they called it the Olympics. Well, uh, for their rubric, they had the gold medal, the silver and the bronze. So, you know, you can play around with this and have fun with it and it will affect how your students view their coursework. So it's just something for you to consider as you look at this. And I don't wanna make you memorize it, so. Um, We'll keep going. We will look at it um, a little bit more. So this one right here, that's um, the center section. This is kind of the meat of it. These are um, descriptors and they tell the students what I'm looking for in their writing. What is each level of performance? So as you can see in this uh, sample here, I think it's zoomed in enough, you can probably um, see it there. 
I've explained that what students should look at um, if they're going for a proficient score. You can see I have different ones for um, developing, novice. So you've got some different ones there. You know, there are pros and cons to this um, as you're looking at this because it, it's a little bit lengthy. You know, I, I put some thought and detail and description into this, but um, one of the perks that this will do for you if you go to create a rubric into this much detail is that it'll in the long run save you time on grading. You won't have to put quite as many feedback comments um, in the paper itself. You can probably put in a few, but this will largely cover it. All right, and I guess the con would be that it does take a little bit longer to create a rubric like this, um, but once you've created it, you can continue to use it. Um, you could use it again in another semester, maybe just tweak it a little bit. So um, it's all about how you wanna manage your time as an instructor. Do you wanna spend more time prepping before students turn in their assignment and come up with a fully fleshed out rubric or do you want to spend more time once your students are turning in their their assignments and putting individual commentary you know in the margins all right so in this one um, I, I did want to highlight the scores here so the scores for each criteria um, actually give a range so you can see some things are 0 to 11 points, 0 to 5 points. You have some different options on how you want to do that. Um, but I think giving yourself a range is really um, a strong approach to developing a rubric. You know, I, you can't blame students for it, but um, we've created a system where their grades are point based. So, you know, if the passing grade is 70 and they get a 69, oftentimes they're going to come to you hunting for that extra point. Um, so giving yourself, you know, that flexibility here and saying it could be a range of points will help you create a stronger stance when you talk to your student, again, about their work. Um, at this point, we're hoping that, you know, when our students look at their grades, um, we want them to think about their grades in the context of the work that they submitted. So um, we're trying to, to frame this, this conversation with our rubric, if that makes sense. All right, um, we also do have, I forgot to mention, um, another workshop that is an interactive Blackboard uh, rubric workshop. And so that one's really nice, whether you are an ultra user or an original course view user, it'll bounce back and forth uh, between the two views and it'll show you if you've never used Blackboard to um, build a rubric. Um, we'll show you how to, you can customize one of those you know, inside your Blackboard course. So that was something I forgot to mention there. You can also choose um, to weight your grades if you want. That's another possibility. Um, and if you don't like points, you can also do percentages. So um, just kind of wanted to throw that out there. Try to be consistent. I would try to match whatever you have going in your syllabus. So if your syllabus uh, tells students that you're going to be grading on percentages, maybe do the same thing with your rubrics. Uh, it'll just make it easier for students to follow along. And see, there's some more of them. I just wanted to show you kind of a little bit of a difference. Not a, not a huge difference, but um, just something to look at. One of the things here um, that I noticed with this example that occurs to me as an instructor is I would not put it in this order as well. Um, students tend to read their rubrics, you know, top to bottom. So if there is a section of your assignment that is worth more points or more percentages, like in this instance, research is worth 20%. Um, I tend to put that at the top of the rubric so that they can see 
you know, if they're, they're concerned about time management and where should they focus their attention, um, try to try to reiterate that through your rubric just in the organization layout. I would move this uh, research actually to the top and I would put purpose below it. So that was another key aspect. All right, so here's our task analysis. And I do kind of love this little picture here. So the task analysis is when you break your assignment or task into unique components and aspects and dimensions. So it kind of mirrors what we hope our students are doing as they actually approach their assignment. We hope that they're breaking it into smaller groups. Um, you begin with something that you want to assess. You consider its features, and then you determine how to represent those features in your rubric. So the rubric should address all aspects of the outcomes being measured, and it should not address anything extraneous. So um, a good example of this might be if you were giving out a science project. Um, in those instances, spelling and grammar might not really need a place on your rubric. Now, in my case, in English composition, um, I guarantee you that that's going to deserve its own little spot in the rubric. So again, you wanna make sure that your rubric is central and focused to your individual needs. Um, if the assessment needs to address critical thinking skills, you definitely need to make sure that you have a spot in that uh, rubric for it. Um, which of your course outcomes does the assignment address? You might wanna put that in there. And are those elements being assessed in the rubric? So um, we're trying to make everything kind of cohesive and linked together. So these are all things that you want to consider as you develop this grading rubric. Okay. I hope you appreciated the picture. I thought his expression was kind of funny. But this is what we call criteria overload. Um, a criterion, and that's the plural of criteria, um, is the feature you want to measure or to judge student performance. And we should drive criteria from assignment prompts, grading sheets, yes, checklists, they still have a place in this, um, and anything else we've used to help students prepare for the assessment. But you want to keep the numbers of criteria manageable uh, for you and for your students. So you'll see kind of on the left here, are this rainbow color-coded rubric. Um, look at how many different shades of, of gray and white we have in there. Uh, visually, it is overwhelming. And I think your students would have a hard time focusing on something like this. So too many criteria may signal that the assessment is actually attempting to do too much. So it likely will confuse your students and it is going to be time consuming for you to develop and use for grading. If you had to go through every single one of these boxes um, in the long run, you actually wouldn't save time by using the grading rubric, which is actually one of the goals that we're trying to go for. So you do uh, want to determine exactly what you want to, what to assess. Um, and it should be tied to your course objectives. And how will you assess it using, um, you know, during this particular assignment, I guess I should say. And that's how you're going to start with creating your effective rubric. So now we can actually look at some of these different types of criteria here. Um, and I think it's going to depend on the type of assessment you've created. So hopefully you can see we have some different things going here. For instance, if you were doing an electronic presentation, which I think was popular pre-pandemic, but is really um, getting even more popularity now, could be PowerPoint presentations or video or audio recording, uh, you might wanna look into things such as the technical quality, the aesthetics, the visuals, um, writing mechanics, if it is a PowerPoint, you know, that's still, still a big thing. If you were talking about a written paper, you might look at things like content, organization, the thesis statement, uh, writing conventions, those types of things, versus say a musical performance. And that could be about their steadiness, their breathing, the appropriate instrument usage, their interpretation, or even their accuracy and how they play a piece. So we've got lots of things going on right there. Okay. 
All right, so as far as the level of performance are concerned, um, we're gonna try to use adjectives to describe degrees of mastery. So some examples could include exemplary, proficient, competent, acceptable, satisfactory, developing, novice, et cetera. You can determine number of levels necessary to assess uh, distinctions of performance. You can begin with few and then move to more as necessary. Um, the more labels on the rubric, the more difficult it might be uh, to differentiate between them and to articulate precisely why one student's work falls under the scale level and one does not. So, um, you know, we said earlier, I think, um, at least I think I said it, that you're going to need a rubric with at least two levels of performance. Um, ideally, I would say no more than five, somewhere between two to five. So labels can influence interpretations of performance level. So again, just be kind of cognizant of how you label it. What language did you use? And labels can be used with or without descriptors, um, but adding descriptors can cut down again on the amount of written feedback that you need to provide, you know, like we said in the margins. Um, so this will just kind of help you expedite the grading process, particularly if you have a fairly large course load. So um, that's definitely something to keep in mind. If you find your students are kind of like in a shade of, I, don't, I hate saying the shade of gray, but if you find them between maybe two levels of performance, you know, struggling right here between fair and good, that's still one of those areas I think where you're going to have to insert some additional commentary for your students. And that's fine. And I think that's expected. Um, I don't want to say that a rubric replaces your individual comments. Um, it just cuts down on the extent in which you need to include them. So as we were talking about personalizing these labels, um, you can personalize them as long as you explain what they mean. So you can really use any, any performance label that you like, um, just as long as that you have some type of an explanation to go along with it. Um, so you could give them a table, you could put it in your Blackboard course, you could put it in your um, syllabus, you know, you could put it at the top of every rubric or down at the bottom like a legend, um, but just somewhere so that they can refer back to it so uh, that these words have meaning to your students. Um, my definition of proficient could be vastly different than yours. So um, it's just nice to have this for your students so that they know what your individual expectations are. So here are the descriptors again. Um, a couple of things that you can do um, to just kind of help this along to make this, you know, uh, a really easy to read, uh, comprehensive rubric is be sure to spell out each level of performance for each criterion. Um, describe what performance at each level looks like. Tell your students explicitly how their work is going to be assessed. Um, it can help you also distinguish between the levels of student work, you know, are they, are they hovering between proficient and competent? Uh, the more descriptors you have here, the more it'll, it'll make the decision for you. Um, it can be omitted, but it does aid in uh, being objective, um, and it also just helps with the overall design of the rubric. So, um, Descriptors should contain at a bare minimum, a description of the highest level of performance. Um, and it probably should have the lowest level. So again, we, like we said, somewhere in your uh, rubric, you should have you know, between two to five different levels um, that your students can score on. So you need something in here. We can't leave these cells blank. <laughs> And then as far as the scores go, uh, when you're developing scores for your rubric, you should probably ask yourself, how many points are needed to describe adequately the range of performance you're seeking in student work? That's the question. Um, scores are a system of numbers or values to rate criteria. Scores could be quantitative, qualitative, or a combination. So um, consider the range of possible performance levels. 
So high to low, low to high. Um, I personally prefer to put, uh, when I create my rubrics, put the high performance on the left. Um, and as they, you know, goes downhill, uh, we read left to right. So we always want our students to excel. We should, you know, put first and foremost in their brain, you know, this is the, this is the way to get an A. You know, this is showing me that you have excelled and have mastered this skill. It is a personal preference, um, but I think this is actually becoming kind of an industry standard. So let's see. You could um, use a separate scale for each criterion. Um, that's another possibility, um, which we've discussed in kind of weighted grades, um, but you wanna make sure to define specifically um, how scores will align with checklist items in your rubric. Um, you wanted to associate your point values or your, or your percentages, either or, whatever you're comfortable with, um, with their performance levels. And you do wanna think of your scores and your scale kind of as a part of a larger whole. So if that makes sense. Um, hopefully I didn't, didn't muddle that too much. Uh, but basically we're, we're trying to look at, your, your students need to know how many points for individual criteria, um, you know, what's mid range, what's the high range, um, and so they, they can try to, you know, kind of balance their performance. And again, as far as aesthetics go with that rubric, I tend to say, um, start at the top with your biggest, you know, your biggest points, like what's the biggest chunk of points, what's the biggest uh, percentage of the, you know, of the grading. For me, you know, if I'm working on an essay, um, again, it's going to be the thesis statement. So, um, you know, I want to make that right at the top of their rubric. Um, and I, I want my score to reflect um, that the largest amount of points, you know, out of, if it was out of a whole, possible 100 points, you know, 40 points are going towards the thesis statement. I want to make sure that my students understand this is a really crucial part of where they need to focus their attention. I have a question, Megan. Yes. This is Molly. So um, in the case, so let, let's say there are certain components of a paper that you want them to do or that they need to make sure that they include and they're broken into pieces. So what I've done um, for an assign for a previous assignment is it goes in the order. So we'll take the, so the intro and the conclusion information that's in line or that's in the kind of going across the top there um, and then kind of going within the structure of the paper according to how it's laid out even if there is a, a subtle point differentiation? What are your? That's a great question. I, you know, and I don't think that's necessarily um, a wrong approach either. You know, if you're approaching your rubric in the same kind of chronological order that you want your students to approach the assignment, um, I, I certainly think that would be a, a great way to, to mimic that behavior, um, especially if there is a kind of a, a specific approach. If you want your students to start at the top and work their way to the bottom, um, that's a great way to emulate that through your rubric is to remain consistent like that. Um, I would probably, if on the day that I handed out, you know, the, the assignment prompt, um, again, I like to put the rubric right there with it at the time um, that the the assessment or the assignment prompt goes out. Um, I, I would probably have a conference with the students say, hey, just so you know, like that center section is worth a large chunk of points, um, just to draw their attention to it further. But I, I really don't think that there would be anything wrong with um, mixing up the order in that case. Thank you. So I hope that answered their question. Um, any other questions coming in? All right, so um, we have four different types of rubrics that we can take a look at. So there is the holistic one, which provides kind of an overall assessment with a, a single scale of performance. There is the analytic one, which um, assesses separate attributes, criteria, dimensions across uh, different performance levels. That was actually kind of what we were looking at uh, earlier with my rubric for the essay assignment. There is a task specific rubric, and this one measures only one unique task. So it is very goal oriented. It's got a single track you know, focus. And then there is what we call the general rubric. And this one would measure criteria um, that are general across a group of different tasks. 
So I have some examples that we can take a quick peek at. So analytic rubrics, I, I think I mentioned this before, uh, these are the most common form of rubrics. This is what most of us I think are familiar with. The analytic rubric articulates levels of performance for each criterion so you can assess student performance. Um, analytic rubrics are useful for complex performances, skills, projects um, with multiple criteria um, and dimensions. So they do judge specific criteria separately, which is nice. You know, you could have a wonderful writer in your course, uh, but there's still an area where they're a little bit weak. In, and that's what this rubric is good at pointing out is it can say, hey, you know, here are all of your strengths, but also these are areas where you could um, improve. And it can also be used uh, for students to self-assess um, their understanding of a their performance. So it's nice to turn the tables. Sometimes we think like we, we're the only ones using rubrics. Um, you could give this rubric to a student and ask them to grade themselves. So that's a, a great task. And um, it may take time to, to score, you know, somebody's work just depending on how, how much you get into. Um, but again, I think we, we said, you know, kind of a good rule of thumb is uh, anywhere between uh, two to five levels. So this one I think has inadequate, uh, deficient, beginning, developing, accomplished, exemplary. Um, this one's actually probably even a little bit more than, than what I would get into. So the holistic rubric, does not just make you feel calm looking at that? Um, this one is meant to treat everything as a whole rather than its parts. So um, therefore a holistic rubric um, in contrast to an analytic rubric does not list separate levels of performance for each criterion. Um, instead, a holistic rubric is going to assign the level of performance by assessing uh, performance across multiple criteria as a whole. And I'll, we'll take a look at this, I promise. So um, the holistic rubrics, though, are best suited for simple projects or performance. So this probably isn't going to be something you're going to use on a final project, a midterm, you know, a large uh, case study, things of this nature. Um, they're going to give a quick snapshot or an overview of the quality. It's going to rate the entire project um, activity or performance. It's going to provide a single score. So, um, and it's going to combine all important elements of the project or performance. And it doesn't really give you the analysis of the strengths and weaknesses. So it doesn't give you a lot of feedback to, for um, guided improvement. So here's an example on your screen. If you got three points, you're an exemplary student two, you're competent, one, um, you're going to need some improvement. So you could still use this even for your smaller projects. And maybe like oral reports, um, things like this. All right. Not trying to rush through it. I know we're getting close to about 15 minutes left. I wanted you to take a look at it to, to get some ideas going. Um, let's take a look at our task specific rubrics. So a task specific rubric provides detailed guidance for just that single task. Um, it provides for consistent scoring and it identifies what students know, uh, facts, procedures, methods, equations. Uh, this is really good kind of for that scientific mindset. We're, we're really checking this one particular skill. Um, however, it, it may be difficult, the downside to using these is that it may be difficult to develop a new rubric for each task. So um, this can get pretty, pretty repetitive if you try to come up with a new rubric like this for each, each new skill level. Um, I think I used to see these a lot as a student, uh, particularly when I was taking introductory communication or speech courses. Um, they would look at things like your posture and uh, facial expression and voice volume. So um, these were kind of the, the types of rubrics I would see for those particular, um, 
I guess, performance features, if you will. And then last but not least, we have our general rubric. So a general rubric can be used across um, similar performances or projects. So this could be all similar projects or presentations, and it enables students to see the big picture. So it does reduce development time. Now the, the con or the negative to this is that your feedback may be very, very general. So um, there's not a lot of information here about what means you're getting a C versus a B. So this is just very, very general. Um, I don't use this type too much in my courses, but it might be great if you were just talking about an overall um, set of projects. If I had four different writing projects that were similar, um, if I wanted to use this as an umbrella rubric for, for what they're getting into, maybe that's a great starting point. So, let's move on to some tips that I can give you for your own specific development of these rubrics. Tip number one, write descriptors. Remember descriptors are these kind of, what I call the meat of it, the big uh, boxes here in the center of the rubric. You're going to want to write appropriate descriptions for each performance level. You wanna explain what the performance is going to look like at each level. So this could include the depth, the breadth, the quality, the scope, the extent, the complexity, the degree, or the accuracy. Um, so these are all like, some key terms that you can throw in there that are going to work well for you. You're going to include indicators for each level, um, major to minor, and you're going to be consistent um, to inconsistent or always or rarely. Um, things that I, I like to include in here when I'm writing descriptor um, is I like to use language that is a bit subjective. Um, I might use the word like, I, um, students may have up to five grammar errors. Um, words and language are subjective as well, right? So we want to leave wiggle room to express to our students, you know, why they were graded the way they were graded. Grading is subjective and trying to make grading um, a black and white issue, it, it doesn't work like that. So um, I, I tell people to try to embrace it and to use language that kind of coincides with that. Let's see. Determine scores and values. So you want to identify the maximum number of points for achieving the highest level of quality. Um, and then you want to assign a number to each of the lower levels. Um, so that's, you know, try to try to be somewhat consistent. I think the standard grading scale, uh, you know, would be 90 to 100 is an A, right? 80 to 89 is a B. Um, and, and the nice thing about those numbers is that uh, it's an even range of points from each grade. So, um, you know, you might want to do that with your rubrics too. If you have a very small window for A's and everything else is a B, um, you know, it, it's going to look a little, a little confusing to your students. Um, so you, you kind of want to space them out evenly. Um, the gradations, I, basically what I was trying to say is they should make sense mathematically, um, depending on the total number of points available, the number of criteria, and the number of performance levels or percentages. So uh, just try to make it a little bit even. We like it to look balanced. And then the third tip, which is to test and revise. So grading has always been and will always be slightly subjective. And this is because we're looking at the quality of work that a student is submitting. And quality is always going to be subjective. So instead of trying to eliminate that aspect, you want to use your rubrics to help clarify your expectations. 
Um, when students wish to discuss their grade, you want to refer back to the rubric and then examine their performance as a larger piece. Um, we're trying to use rubrics to help students look at their overall performance. We want them to look at the work that they are submitting as opposed to focusing on, you know, just a number. And we do know that students are focused on numbers. Their grades are based on points and percentages. Um, however, in the context that we want to talk to students about what they're doing in the class, we want to reframe that conversation to, to look at, you know, what kind of work have they submitted and how does it match up with your, um, with your stated expectations. So you do want to leave yourself, you know, room to have that discussion. So that's why I said, you know, use your words uh, carefully and your rubrics, you know, make sure that um, you use the language that is a little bit, um, I guess, open to, to interpretation. Uh, you know, you want to invite that conversation with your students. Like, why do you think you deserve an A? Like, tell me, tell me why. Um, so you also just want to make sure that your language always reflects that you're open to having those conversations. And then of course, revise as necessary. So once you've used a rubric, you can determine if it worked well, um, if certain aspects worked well, but others need tweaking. Um, and the nice part is once you've used a rubric and you've saved it, um, it's a lot easier just to adjust it and make changes than it is to start from scratch. But I do have some tips on that as well. Okay, so we have uh, some resources up here on the screen for you. And as promised, um, at the uh, end of this workshop, so either today, probably more likely tomorrow, um, I will send you a link with this recording. And then um, I'll also have all of these, uh, these links right here that you see on the screen. So there are um, a variety of resources that we have at NIU. So here's some of them. If you want to take a workshop on learning how to create an interactive Blackboard rubric, and again, this will work for both um, or Blackboard original users and Blackboard Ultra users, uh, we have one on that. So we'll show you just kind of step by step, you know, how to use the LMS system. So that's a nice feature there. We also have our own uh, Blackboard website, which is dedicated to resources and tutorials about creating rubrics. So um, please be sure to check that out. It has lots of great tips um, and all sorts of resources that you can use. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but our Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning has a news blog. And so we have articles that various authors have written uh, with tips and suggestions for how to create your own uh, rubric. Uh, okay, I see a discussion here. So let's see, there's discussion about changing our LMS. When will we know um, when that will be ro uh, rolled out? That's a great question. We are in the middle of our LMS review. So um, it's starting to wrap up. I think June, we will know the official answer. I, I honestly don't know either. So, um, you know, I think it'll be a surprise to everybody. Uh, our faculty are involved in comparing uh, Blackboard, Canvas, and D2L. So those are the three contenders. So we may remain with Blackboard or we may move on to one of the other two, uh, but it would not be implemented this fall. It would be um, a year from now. So we need time to, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I know, I feel you're, I feel your relief on that one. We, we would need time to make all of those conversion plans. So um, for right now, all of this information that you see from these resources from NIU, I guarantee are still going to be um, accurate for a full year. They're developed you know, just for our particular LMS system that we use. And then I do have some additional resources for you uh, that are outside of NIU. So these um, top two I have used, there's the um, iRubric and RubyStar. And so these are basically free online tools uh, that help teachers to create rubrics. And I believe it's the top one, don't quote me on this. Um, the iRubric one is where you can share your rubric. So um, it's either 
iRubric or Ruby star, but um, it, it basically, it, it's just a, a collective, I don't know, housing of, of all these different types of rubrics that instructors across the nation have made. And I, I will admit it is jumbled in there. Like be prepared for information overload because you have um, not just higher ed instructors, but you also have K through 12 in there. However, it has every type of rubric you can think of. Um, their filtering isn't always the greatest, but you can try to filter it by your field of interest. So you know, if you're doing management, if you're doing early education, um, you, can, you can just swipe these rubrics for free. Um, and, and then, you know, once you have it, you can tweak it and change it. So a lot of these rubrics are already pre-built for you. Um, and it, as we said, you know, it's a lot easier just to take something that's pre-existing um, and make changes. So those are some great ones. Uh, this is another one my, uh, my colleague put on here, the Teachnology. Um, I haven't used that one. So it looks like there's some samples and then others are for purchase. And um, there's also a rubric builder. So a lot of these, um, the bottom two, like you can test them out, but then they want you to, to pay. And so I, I did promise you, uh, I will send you that follow-up email. It'll have the link to the recording and I'll put all of these links in there. So you can just, you know, click on these and check out these uh, links, but it's so nice that instructors just across the nation are sharing their rubrics. So if you don't have one you like, or if you're maybe bored with the ones in your department, trust me, there are a lot of them out there. And then if you ever need anything, you know, feel free to contact me directly, um, or you can just get a hold of the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning. That's our CIDL group. That's what we're going by because it's such a mouthful. So you can just call us CIDL. <laughs> but um, we do all sorts of things. We have additional workshops that you can sign up for. We do one-on-one -on -one consultations. So um, primarily we're doing those virtually now since everyone's working remote. So if you have any questions, uh, let us know. We are happy to assist. And we've got about four or five minutes left. I'm gonna hang around. I'm gonna turn off the recording, but if you have any questions, please let me know.